If you would, go ahead and take your Bibles and let's turn to Genesis chapter 3. We actually started this new series last week. Uh, for those of you that might not have been with us, we did the song Rattle last week. And uh, I heard a, a little bit of rumbling from the folks my apologies to those of you that are watching us uh, because we were not able to show that song at the same time that we used it here in the service. And that has to do with copyright um, problems and issues. And we can do a lot of things now that we couldn't do before, but we cannot actually show a video like that while we are using it. Uh, so uh, Teresa did go out on the website and put the link so that you could watch that song and then listen to us as we talked about it. But thank you for your positive comments and, and I'll forgive those of you that griped, okay? It wasn't any of you, it was the folks that were on. I'll forgive you guys too, okay? All right. Genesis chapter 3 is the first time that sin enters into the story. This is a very sad story. But I think we're going to learn a lot from it. We are really getting into this series um, where we're talking about how Jesus did it again. God did it again. And for the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at four different passages of Scripture that will march us out throughout the Old and New Testament while we look at what Jesus has done for us. And so there's no better place to start than at the beginning. And uh, we're going to jump right in there. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. The words will be on the screens behind me as well. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman... This is the serpent talking now. Did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Verse 2. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from trees in the garden. Verse 3. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. We already, if you're following what's been said previously, you know that we have some issues already with what's being said here. Verse 4. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. Verse 5. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. Now we're going to stop right there. We're gonna, we'll go on in just a second. But if you're like me and you grew up in Sunday school and the flannel graph board and they, they didn't have video things back then, you know, some of us are going, yeah, I understand. And some of you are going, you guys are so old. It's disgusting, you know. Um, if you grew up like I did in church, then the picture that was always used and what I picture in my mind is a big, red, juicy apple. Okay? That's what comes to our mind. However, I have come to the point of believing that it wasn't just an apple. Because I want you to listen. Uh, just look at that verse 6 again. It, it says, this, this is the description of that piece of fruit. And you tell me, how did she know, just from looking at this piece of fruit, that this was what it was capable of? Look at this. When the woman saw that the fruit was, number one, good for food. Okay, that's like, duh, right? Number two... Pleasing to the eye. Ooh, I like that. And then third, desirable for gaining wisdom. That's some piece of fruit, isn't it? She took some and ate it. In my mind, it had to be something chocolate covered. <laughs> that is the only thing that would have worked in, under these circumstances. I'll give you maybe a caramel apple, uh, but none of that candied apple stuff. I never got into dark chocolate. Oh, dark chocolate dipped apple would be fantastic, but we stray here. <laughs> All right, last half of verse 6. She also gave some to her husband who was with her. That's a, something to take note of. 
He was there, okay? He was with her and he ate it. Verse 7, and the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Now, this story ends, if we can jump all the way to the end, with Adam and Eve being banished from the garden. Everything changed in their relationship with God because of this disobedience. But what I want you to notice, first of all tonight, we're going to be looking, first of all, at, at kind of Satan's part of this and then God's part of this. But the first thing I want you to notice is that the serpent really has an incredibly brilliant strategy for leading this first couple astray. All right? I know some of you just really think the Bible is nothing more than a symbolic book. You know, it's a, a book full of fairy tales. And, and I will admit that to an extent, the Bible has times when it is very symbolic. But there are many, many more times where the Bible is very literal in what it has to say. And uh, the Bible has a story that runs all the way through it. Uh, it, there's like a thread that goes all the way through, and I would call it the story of God. God is creator. God is master. God is righteous judge. God is redeemer. God as soon coming king. And that, we need to hang on to that, but this particular part of the story is really about a talking snake. And as Christians, we believe this. We believe that there actually was a talking snake, uh, but we rarely stop to go deep with these thoughts. But I want us to think a little more deeply tonight because there's so much more here than just a bunch of symbolism. What we have tonight is an opportunity to evaluate the strategy that Satan uses to get into our minds and our hearts, destroy our lives, and lead us away from God. Now, people have raised questions about this particular story as long as people have been around to read this particular story. The number one question that gets asked is this, why did God put the tree in the garden in the first place if he didn't want them to eat from it? Interesting question, isn't it? I've had that question. I hope you have too. Some scholars believe that uh, had they not disobeyed, that there would have come a time when Adam and Eve were allowed to eat from this tree. Uh, but it's kind of like, you know, there was some process they had to go through and they weren't really ready for that yet. Uh, some people say that God put the tree there because God wanted to give them a chance to obey him because that's really the way love works. There has to be trust. There has to be some common ground. There has to be some obedience. I would say this story is definitely a picture of the way good and evil function in the world that we live in today. I think it comes right down to that. So I want to talk about this phrase that the serpent used. I, I want to talk about how when he wanted to leave, lead Adam and Eve astray, and for that matter, he wants to lead you and I astray, um, he doesn't do it in really obvious ways. If we understood how he worked, and if we understood the help of God that is available to us, uh, I don't think any snake would be able to slither up and lead us away from life with God. And, and you don't really see Satan as that being his tactic. So what does Satan do? First thing that he does is he poses a question. Satan ever put a question mark in your mind about something? Oh my goodness, yes. Yes. By the way, there is a real art to asking questions. If you work with people very long, you come to understand that there's a right way and a wrong way to ask questions. Most of us, myself included, we could all learn how to ask better questions. Amen? You've been asked questions the wrong way before, and you wish that you could cram it back in their mouths as it is coming out? Okay, I'm the only one who ever wants to do that. Um, <laughs> For those of us who talk for a living, there can be times when honestly, we talk too much and we find ourselves overpowering other people in the conversation. And I'll be honest, I feel it happening as it's happening and I find myself talking and talking and talking and inside, I'm saying to myself, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. <laughs> so I have tried to learn the fine art 
of asking questions. Now, I'm not talking about interrogating people, all right? Do not like to be interrogated, do you? No. Oh, no, not at all. But actually, what I want to do is I, I want to learn how to get through to people so that they can share whatever is important to them. For instance, I've learned that good questions oftentimes are open-ended questions. So, for instance, instead of just asking the question, do you like the crosswalk, and, and somebody saying, well, yeah, I like it, or no, I don't, conversation over, instead, we could say something like, what do you think about the crosswalk? And then, you know, you're going to say, well, they got that really nice preacher, you know. That, I don't know, I just, I just put it here. But when you ask an open-ended question, you have all kinds of options and directions that you can go in. I've also learned that when you give people multiple choice options after you ask the question, that's not very helpful either. For instance, hey, what do you want to do today? Do you want to go to the park? Do you want to go to the riverfront? Do you want to go out to eat? Do you want to sit around and watch a movie? Which movie would you like to watch? Would you like some popcorn with that? And we're like, enough. What was the original question? I don't remember what, what it was you were asking. Uh, people can get lost in that kind of questioning. So hear me carefully when I say that the devil is a master question asker. You see it, that rhymed? A master question asker. Somebody needs to write that down. You're going to need that sometime. And I would add this. To the point that the only one that asks better questions than the devil is God himself. I think God is the master question asker. If you don't believe me, just read the book of Job sometime. And you get into that section where Job is actually being interrogated by God which is just a fascinating conversation. So, we have this slithering snake who is the embodiment of evil. And I want us to look at the actual question that the enemy used to lead Eve away from life with God. So let's go back to verse 1. In verse 1 it says, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Everything in your life that is dysfunctional is the result of answering this question the wrong way. Everything that's dysfunctional is because we answered this question the wrong way. The question is, did God really say this? This is starting to show us the strategy that the enemy has. And I maintain that we cannot defeat our enemy if we do not understand how our enemy operates. So the key to winning the battle for our thoughts, the key to winning the battle for our joy, or our peace, or our families, or our wisdom, or all the things that God has called us to enjoy, we've got to understand how the enemy works to try to lead us astray. He's crafty. So he doesn't walk up to Eve and say, Hey, Eve. Hey, baby. You know how awesome the garden is. And how good God is. And how he's giving you everything. And you're living here rent free. And you got this great setup. And you're never very far from whatever you're hungry for. So, Eve, baby. Why don't you trash this whole thing and you and the guy get thrown out of the garden and while you're at it, why not just go ahead and ruin it for the rest of humanity? Yeah. That is not, that's what happens, but that's not what he's asking her. And is, is, it, is it just me or is there a part of you that's going, how could they do this? How could, how could Adam and Eve do this? How could they mess up something that was so great for the rest of us? Well, I think it's because of the same reason we mess everything up today. It's because the enemy doesn't issue a direct temptation. He's not going, you know, it's not blatantly disobedient, at least in the way he's asking them. Think about it this way. as a little e equation. I don't have this on the screen. But he posed a question that created a doubt that led to disobedience. Little, little sequence there. He posed a question, did God really say that? Which did what? Created a doubt, which then led to disobedience. 
The enemy's not dumb. Don't you wish he was? Don't you wish you could say, Satan, you ignoramus, leave me alone. You know, and you slap him down and he runs away and he leaves you alone. But Satan is not going to tell you, hey, why don't you blow off God? Why don't you dishonor God now so that you can regret this for the rest of your life? The enemy doesn't do that. Instead, the serpent hangs... Go ahead and give me my little hangy mark here. The serpent hangs, hangs a question mark over God's instructions. All the time. All the time he's hanging question marks over God's instructions for our lives. And, and we, we really understand this better than we think we do. For instance, you know, we're, we're keying in off that question, did God really say? Here's, here's a question. Is the Bible really the word of God? Because if you knew for a fact that it was the word of God and you could prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that it was the word of God, then it would be, a so, it would be so much easier to live according to the word of God even when it called you to make sacrifices. If you could know that you know that you know. But what happens here? The enemy just placed a doubt inside your mind. So like when the enemy places a doubt inside the mind of a high school student that the Bible really isn't that trustworthy, then why not go ahead and experiment with sex? Why not go ahead and drink all you want? Because, you know, what, what if you've you got to see if there's more out there, right? You've got to see if there's something you're missing. Did God really say these things? Now, I, I, I believe in you guys, okay? I don't necessarily believe in everybody else, but I believe in you guys. I think if the enemy straight up confronted you and tried to bully you into some kind of submission, I don't think you'd stand for it. I think you're too smart for that. Um, and I think he's too smart to try to push us into something when he doesn't have to. What does he do? He lures us into it. Yeah, let me give you a question. So if we look over our lives... I wonder what areas in your life tonight would have question marks hanging over them. You know why he's got to raise question marks? It's because God has made promises to us, hasn't he? God has spoken truth over our lives. And the enemy cannot take our promises away. The enemy cannot take that truth away. But what he does do is he puts a question mark over God's promises to see if maybe he can get us to doubt God. And if he can get us to doubt God, then he can lead us to disobey God. And if he can get us to disobey God, he will lead us away from life with God. And he can do that exactly the way that he wants to. And he can start with something as simple as a question. But, I like the way the Apostle Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter, 11, chapter 2 verse 11. Paul says, for we... Us, right? Amen? All of us? We are not unaware of his schemes. His here being Satan. We are not unaware. Which is why I have to preach a message like this. Because I want us to understand. Could Paul say that about us? Maybe. Maybe not. Can I just tell you from a worldwide point of view, we're getting killed out there because we're being deceived. There are all kinds of question marks being placed over our lives. Now, I've made statements this before, but I think we need to go down this road. If you have children, you understand the devil better than some. <laughs> kind of a mean thing to say, but it's true, isn't it? Right. You understand, parents, you understand the nature of evil. You understand the inherent danger of sin. You have no problem believing in the doctrine of original sin. That Adam sinned and we're all sinners and you've seen it in your children. And I would suggest to you that the way your kids work you has a lot in common with the way the devil works you. Now go with me here, okay? When my kids were little, I remember my daughter coming up one evening and saying, Daddy, can we stay up late tonight? And my first question, guaranteed, my first question was, what did your mom say? 
You know, it, it, you're, I'm putting that on the level of did God really say? Because mom isn't God, but she was pretty close at our house. Okay? Especially when it came to bedtimes and eating and things of that nature. So what we tried to operate with at our house was whatever mommy says, daddy says. Okay? That was, that was our goal. Even if the two of us did not agree before she said it, once she said it, I'm in complete agreement with her. Okay? So don't come to me with this, mommy said this, but I think we should do that kind of junk. Okay? But kids learn, don't they? Oh, they learned. So it went something like this. Daddy, can we stay up late? What did mom say? Well, she didn't give us an exact bedtime. What's happened is that Dion had gone to her mother and asked, can we stay up late? And mother said, no. So she comes to me and asks, can we stay up late? What did your mom say? Well, she didn't give us an exact bedtime. So then it's up to me. Did you ask your mom if you could stay up late? Yes. Did she say yes or no? Yes. Well, which was it? Which did she say? No. And that's what she said is what I say. You know, that was the way the conversation went. Now, if Eve could have gotten this one right, Maybe everything would be different. I don't know. I'm afraid they would have waited for my turn and I would have blown it for all of us anyway. Okay? I, I just, you know. So we're back to that question. Did God really say you may not eat from any tree in the garden? So let me ask you that question. Did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Is that what, is that what God said? No, it's not. Let's look at these verses. This is you back up a chapter, Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. This is where God gives the original command to Adam and Eve. In verse 16, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. The serpent conveniently left that little detail out of the interrogation. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, let's go back to chapter 3, verse 1. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the other wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? See, what's happened here is now Satan has introduced a question mark that is now hanging over Eve's thinking. The correct answer in this situation is to walk away from the conversation. Did you hear me? Because that is going to come to your benefit when somebody starts raising those questions in your life. The correct answer is to walk away from the conversation. The correct answer is to discontinue your conversation with all of the snakes in your life. Why do we feel like we have to have an argument with a snake? Why do we feel like we have to go down that road? We don't owe them an explanation. And because Eve didn't walk away, she missed the whole point of what was going on here. Because Satan will not only hang a question mark over God's instructions, he will also hang a question mark over God's intentions. Hey, Eve, baby. You know the real problem here is that God just doesn't really want you to have any fun. If God doesn't want you to eat any of that fruit, why did he put it here in the first place? You can just kind of feel that, can't you? Well, you and I both know God, yes, God wants us to eat fruit. And this may be the biggest revelation that God is going to give some of us. We have also bought the lie. We have believed the line that is being fed to us, and we have doubted God's intentions because when the serpent went to get Eve to leave God's protection, he just used a question. Did God really say that? And then he tried to get her to doubt God was really good and convince her that God was just keeping her away from something good. Here's what you and I do, okay? And you need to think this through. We try to make God a God of limitation. We try to make God a God of limitation. 
But if you're following the story, the very first command that God gave was a command of liberty, not of limitation. God says basically, yeah, you can eat tree, you can eat any fruit off any tree you want anywhere in the garden. It's good. Don't worry about paying me back. By the way, you can't anyway. I love you. I made you. You're mine. And I'll meet you after dinner and we'll take a walk around the garden. The first command that he gives is a command of liberty. And you want to see how good it was, really, in the garden? I think we all have some idea about how good it really was in the garden. The garden was awesome. Let's go to chapter 2, verse 25. This is all the verse that men ever need to know that God was good. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Awesome verse, men. Come on. Smile a little bit. Naked all the time and feeling no shame. Adam's naked. Eve is naked. The food is good. And yet still somebody introduces a question mark into this. It's crazy because it's a snake. A snake can go from straight to crooked in a moment's notice. Think of the image of a question mark. I've seen snakes in the form of a question mark. And let that stick in your mind all day. Now, does that mean that there are not questions we should be asking? Yes, there are all kinds of good questions. You know, uh, did God really say that it's wrong for you to have money and enjoy nice things? Did God say that? No, we can't find that in scripture. But that's what the enemy wants to get you to do, is to doubt God's intentions towards you. Let me get in real big trouble here, okay? I grew up in a part of the country where there were people who dressed certain ways to show their piety. Some of you are not familiar with that word piety, but it would relate to holiness. And so the women, the girls would wear these long, I'm going to be honest, ugly dresses. They were just ugly. The, the skirts would go all the way down to their ankles. Uh, it was like this whole church was trying to cover up something. You with me? I'm just going to say this. I don't think God intended for whole denominations to decree that what you are allowed to wear and not wear. I don't think whole denominations should be able to tell you that you can't wear makeup. It does wonders for my skin. <laughs> I'm kidding. In fact, I'm guessing there are probably times in heaven where God is going, would you please put some makeup on? <laughs> Just. Okay, now I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm going to get notes about that. So God gives a command, and it's a command of liberation. But the enemy takes it and turns it into limitation. Let me tell you something, the only limitation that God will ever place on you is a limitation to protect and bless your life. God is good, amen? amen? And he does good, and all his ways are perfect. So please don't let any devil in hell put a question mark over the goodness of God in your life. Somebody can say, well, I just got laid off. Some of us know what that's like. Puts a question mark in your mind. But here's my question. Is God still a provider for you? Absolutely. Straighten that question mark back out and, and think of all the times that God has brought you through things in the past. God got you this far. He's not going to let, he, he didn't bring you this far to leave you. And if necessary, he will carry you. Get that serpent out of your ear, out of your heart, and out of your mind. Jesus will speak a better word over your life. God is a God of good intentions. No wonder a lot of young people don't want to come to church. The way we teach things. This was pretty much the way it was when I was growing up. Um, you know, God said you can't eat any fruit off the tree. Here's what I was taught. Sex is dirty and filthy and disgusting, so save it for marriage. <laughs> now, come on. You, some of you grew up in the same kind of background I did. Adam and Eve were naked all the time. It was a good life, okay? Until the enemy insinuated that God's intentions were something other than good. Did God say you can't eat any fruit? 
Well, we can eat fruit, we just can't eat off of that one tree. And the enemy just keeps going because he's crafty. The enemy is also persistent. The enemy is also the father of lies. And the Bible tells us when he speaks lies, he speaks his native language. As a matter of fact, let's continue on with Eve's response in verse 3. It says, but God did say... You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden and you must not touch it or you will die. And the enemy's response in verse 4, you will not. Can't you just hear, you know, like a teenager, not. It's not going to happen. Come on. It's not, that's never going to happen. Any of you here have the same problem I do with your phone with this autocorrect thing? Have you ever had a message go completely awry because it changed a word that didn't need to be changed? And boy, when it changed it, whoo, we probably all got a story. But um, I, this word that he uses here is incredible. He says, you will not certainly die. What's he doing? Introducing a question mark in your mind. No, come on. Verse 5. He goes on, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Doesn't that sound good? I think it sounds exciting. Well, I could be like God. I'm going to know good and evil. And it sounded so good that Eve ate and Adam didn't say a blessed thing. <laughs> but he stood by and ate too. There's a whole sermon series right there. Uh, the whole Adam and Eve thing, okay? Someday. And then, when God came looking for Adam, and you know that it was not because he didn't know where Adam was, right? Uh, by the way, I think the problem here is Adam didn't know where Adam was. Okay? Verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, which would seem like a good thing at first, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Verse 8, get a little shift in the scenery. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God. Is there a part of you want to know what that sound was like? They could hear God walking in the garden. Oh man, kind of freaks me out. I want to know. Do you, you guys read this stuff and don't want to know these things? They heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they did one of the most ridiculous things that you can ever do. They hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. How ridiculous he made the place. <laughs> well, you know, we need to talk about this covering thing because they made coverings for themselves. Why? Because of the shame that they now experienced. And see, our problem is we'll, we'll try to cover up big shame and little shame. Could be the way we tried to speak to somebody else earlier today. We're a little ashamed of that now. Could be the patience that we did not exhibit earlier today. It could be that thought that we did not control earlier today. It could be the Bible passage that we just blew off today. It could be the prayers that we didn't pray today. So now Adam and Eve are ashamed and they hide which is really a pretty bad strategy. Um, you know, can, can you just like, okay, let's, let's go behind this tree. He'll never find us. <laughs> He's everywhere. There is not a fig leaf big enough in this world, Adam. Just leave that there. So we do the same thing. We cover ourselves. We have covered ourselves with our words. We cover ourselves by trying to sound harsh and, and like we really know what we're doing. But the truth is we're broken. And we still try to cover ourselves. We cover ourselves with eating disorders to try to shape or sculpt our bodies to a form that we think will make us acceptable. We cover ourselves with achievement to keep away that gnawing emptiness that if we ever got alone with, it would just tear us apart. But I'm here to tell you tonight, God is so gracious that he came looking for Adam. Don't miss this part of the story. God came looking for Adam. I would have put a target on his back. I'm the only one. You guys are all so good. So nice. 
But it says the man and his wife heard the sound of God, which is another sound in the story. If you're following the sounds in the story, you've got the sound of the serpent telling lies, and now here is the sound of the Lord bringing truth. And as they heard the sound of the Lord, as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, they hid from the Lord, verse 9, but the Lord God called to the man. How grateful are we that we have a God who calls to us. He calls to us even when we are broken. He calls to us when we're in rebellion. And God said, where are you? And maybe that ought to be the question we wrestle with for the rest of the week. Because disobedience to God, it dislocates us. It scrambles the signal so that we don't hear his voice. Where are you today? What are you trying to hide? In, in what area of your life have you been hiding? What fig leaves have you sewn together to try to make a covering for yourself? So God asked Adam and Eve, where are you? Not because he doesn't know, but because they didn't know. And he locates us. In his love, he locates us even when we believe a lie. This is a great story for us, by the way. This is incredible news for us. The story didn't start with sin, and the story isn't going to end with sin. The story will end with Jesus taking care of everything on his terms, to which I would say, he did it again. God did it again. But in the meantime, it would help if you and I would come out of our hiding. God said, where are you? And Adam responded. Was that dumb or what? He's hiding behind a tree, and God goes, where are you? And then Adam starts talking to him. If you're trying to hide from God, don't talk to him. <laughs> you just gave yourself away. Verse 10. Poor Adam. He's just like us, isn't he? He doesn't get it. <laughs> he answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And the next line is probably my favorite part. Uh, it, it, when God looked at Adam and said, who told you that? You ever had your parents say something like that to you? Who told you that? Who told you you were naked? And we could substitute a whole lot of stuff in there, you know. Who told you that you could never be a good dad just because you didn't have a dad growing up? Who told you that you could never, by, by the way, you understand that you can be a good dad if you didn't have a good dad growing up because you have your father in heaven who the Bible tells us is a father to the fatherless? Even when your mother and father forsake you, Scripture says, the Lord will take you in. Who told you that you would never be able to break free from this addiction that you have in your life? I got news for you. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom and liberty. And Jesus came to break every chain and destroy every bondage. Who told you that the way you look makes you different in a bad way? I think those women that are airbrushed on those magazines with their ribs poking out, I think they need a potato with butter and sour cream. Amen. Amen. I really do. Think they're abnormal. Who told you that you would not make it through this storm? Who told you that you could never recover from this fall? Who told you that the best days of your life are already behind you? Listen to me. The devil is a liar. So please join me in telling that serpent to slither away on his belly because the voice of the Lord is calling to his children. And he wants to talk to us about truth and recovery, about freedom and life and restoration. We have a God who meets us in the place of our brokenness. We actually get to hear a voice call through the chaos and confusion who invites us to come out of our shame and hiding which is why I would say the love of Jesus is enough for me. So God confronted Adam and Eve with their sin. He announced that there would be some consequences. Do you remember these? It says the ground will be cursed. Women would give birth to children in pain. And the sin of one man and one woman would now affect all of us. And we have been living outside of paradise ever since. But there is one verse in here that I don't want you to miss because this, this is the very special part to me of this story and I hope that it gives you the boost that it gives me. After God curses the serpent and announces the consequences, God does something very compassionate. 
When he found them in the garden, they were naked, except for their fig leaves. God gets out his sewing machine and starts making clothes of skin for Adam and his wife. And it says in verse 21, he clothed them. You realize he could have condemned them. He could have killed them. But it says he clothed them. The hero of every story in this book is Jesus Christ. And right here, he does it again. He was and is and forever will be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The heart of our God is to cover his children. And then we will no longer have to hide from him. His grace will cover us through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. What Adam lost, Jesus got back. That's why we can say the love of Jesus is enough. And my question, final question for you tonight is this. Will you please let his love cover your life today? Bow with me for prayer, please. Father in heaven, as we've started on this series, we see that you're right there. We don't make a mistake that you're not aware of. And Father, we, we admit tonight, we've got some of those question marks hanging over situations and, and doubts and worries and fears. And Father, we want to ask you to take those question marks away. Help us to send that serpent packing and help us to trust in you. And I pray that we'll gather here again next week to learn even more about how you're taking care of us. Lead us now, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen. Thank you all for being here.